Welcome everyone to our webinar, Demystifying the Distributed Database Landscape. Today, we're gonna to give you a survey of technologies in use today, and a bit of a shape of things to come in this next tech cycle. My name is Peter Corliss. I'm the Director of Technical Advocacy at SillaDB. I listen to our user stories and discover wisdom in each to share with our other practitioners in the industry at large, whether through blogs or in technical presentations. You've likely seen listicles like this all over the web, all of the different database types, all of the places you can deploy such databases, all of the licensing and service models you can imagine. Uh, all of these by, are by now well plumbed concepts developed over the past decades with roots going back over a half century since IBM introduced SQL in 1974. Uh, so weren't all these buzzwords invented by around 2010? I mean, there's nothing more to learn here. We're done, right? Uh, not even a little, because everything people believe they have learned about the distributed database landscape is being challenged every day at new scales, at higher performance characteristics, and in novel applications using newly invented methodologies. The earthly landscape that we walk upon every day usually changes very slowly, measurable in centimeters or inches per year, but the digital landscape and specifically the distributed database landscape is changing at a massive rate. We're in the middle of what we at SillaDB have dubbed this next tech cycle. Uh, so what do we mean by that? Everything is co-evolving from the hardware you run on to the languages and operating systems you work with to the operating methodologies you use every day. So all of those familiar technologies and business models are themselves undergoing revolutionary change. It's obvious to anyone in the industry, we are already in the middle of this next tech cycle. It's not next year or next decade, it's today. And it's a wave that's carrying us forward from trends that got their start earlier this century. It's beyond big data. We're talking huge data. Welcome to the zettabyte era. Uh, this era, depending upon who's defining it, either started in 2010 for total data stored on earth or in 2016 for total internet protocol traffic in a year. Now individual data intensive corporations can be generating information at the rate of petabytes per day and storing exabytes in total. There are some prognosticators who believe we'll see humanity, our computing systems and our IoT enabled machinery generating a half a zettabyte of data per day by 2025. Yet conversely, we're also seeing the importance of small data. Uh, look at the genomics revolution because the RNA gene sequence of say COVID-19 is actually not that big data wise, but it is increasingly important to us to understand every single bite of that information because vaccinating against this global pandemic requires understanding every change of that rapidly evolving pathogen. So it's everything between huge data and small data systems. And the database you need to use needs to align with the volume of that data you have under management. Also, this next tech cycle is not just the cloud computing cycle. AWS launched in 2006, Google Cloud in 2008, Azure formally launched in 2010. So we're already well over a decade past the dawn of the public cloud. Yet this next tech cycle definitely builds on the ecosystems, methodologies, and technologies these hyperscalers provide. So the database you use also has to align with where you need to deploy it. Does it only work in the cloud or can it be deployed on premises far behind your firewall? Does it just work with one cloud vendor or is it deployable to any of them? Uh, these are very important issues. It's also not just the broadband or wireless internet revolutions. We're fully two decades into both of those. Yet the advent of gigabit broadband and the new diverse range of 5G services enable incredible new opportunities in real-time data streaming, IoT, and more. So how does your database work when you need to connect to systems far and near? How important are the limitations of the speed of light to your latencies? How well do you deal with data ingested from hundreds of millions of endpoints at gigabits per second scales? And finally, underpinning all of this are the raw capabilities of silicon, summed up by the transistors, and core counts of this current generation of CPUs. We've already reached uh, 64 uh, core CPUs. The next generation will double that to the point where a single CPU will have more than 100 processors. Fill a rack 
based high performance computer with those and you can easily get the thousands of cores per server. All of this is just traditional CPU based computing. You also have GPU advancements that are empowering the world of distributed ledger technologies like blockchain. And all of this is happening concurrently uh, as IBM plans to deliver a thousand qubit quantum computer by 2023 and Google plans to deliver a computer with a million qubits by 2029. So this next tech cycle is powered by all of these fundamentally revolutionary capabilities. It's what's enabling all this real-time full streaming data from anyone to anywhere. And this is just the infrastructure. Uh, if you dive deeper into that infrastructure, you know that each of the hardware architecture bottleneck points is also undergoing its own revolution. We've already seen CPU densities growing, yet vanilla standalone CPUs themselves are also giving way to full systems on a chip or SOX. And while we've been used, um, uh, well, we've seen them being used in high performance computers in the past, expect to see commonly available uh, server systems with greater than a thousand CPUs. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I think you're gonna see 2000 CPU systems uh, this year uh, available commercially. Uh, these will be the workhorses or more rightly the war horses of this next tech uh, cycle. Huge beasts capable of carrying mighty workloads. Uh, memory, another classic bottleneck, is getting a huge boost from DDR5 today and DDR6 in just a few years. Densities are going up, so you can expect to see Warhorse systems with a full terabyte of RAM. In fact, the i4i just announced by AWS has a full terabyte of RAM at the highest end. Uh, and just like um, these systems uh, have been available in the past, you're gonna start seeing these systems be more commonly available and for businesses, increasingly affordable. Uh, storage is also seeing its own revolution with the recently approved NVMe base and transport specifications, which will enable much easier implementation of NVMe over fabrics. So now software is going to have to play catch up to all these capabilities, just as it took time for kernels and then applications inside of a vertically scaled box to be made async everywhere, sharded per core, and pneumoware. This next tech cycle is going to require systems to adapt to whole new methodologies of getting the most from this hardware. And speaking of methodologies, just take a look at these. Uh, from the dawn of the millennium and onwards, as an industry, we've moved from batch operations and monolithic upgrades performed with multi-hour windows of downtime on the weekend to a world of streaming data and continuous software delivery performed 24 by seven by 365 with zero downtime ever. And by adopting to the cloud and this always on world, we've exposed ourselves and our organizations to a world of random chaos and security threats. Now we have to operate fleets of servers autonomously and orchestrate them across on-premises, edge, and multiple cloud uh, uh, environments. So while Scrum has been around since the 1980s and continuous integration since 1991, in this century, the 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto in 2001 altered the very philosophy, never mind the methodologies, underlying the way software was developed. The Agile Manifesto's very first line talks about the highest priority being to satisfy the customer through continuous delivery of valuable software. However, this specific term, continuous delivery or CD, as we know it today, didn't really take hold till 2009. It was then married at the hip to continuous integration and it coincided with the birth of what we now know as DevOps. So with that, you had a framework for defining change-oriented processes and software life cycles through a responsive developer culture that now, a decade or two into this revolution, everyone takes as a granted. Um, onto that baseline were built tools and systems and philosophies that extended those fundamental principles. The chaos monkeys of the world, as well as the pen testers, want to break your system or break into them to uncover flaws and defects long before something stochastic and catastrophic or someone maliciously does it to you. Cloud native technologies like Kubernetes and single source of truth for infrastructure methodologies like GitOps were created out of the sheer necessity to scale systems to the hundreds of thousands of production software deployments you have under management. And it's still not enough. We've already seen software supply chain attacks with solar winds, uh, low level system attacks like Spectre and Meltdown and Zombie Load or 
human factor threats like deep viral fakes and millions of fictitious social media accounts using profile images generated uh, by generative adversarial networks or GANs, never mind millions of IoT enabled devices being nefariously harnessed for a distributed denial of service botnet attack. So these are just the bow shocks of what's to come. So now your AI powered security systems are locked in combat every day in real time against the threat actors attempting to undermine your normal operations. We know this because a growing number of intrusion prevention and malware analysis systems are built at terabyte and beyond scale distributed using databases like ScyllaDB as their underlying storage engines. So now rather than just DevOps, we talk about DevSecOps because security cannot be an afterthought, not even for your MVP, not in 2021. So these methodologies are continuing to evolve. And here's an example, just as we do not wanna be locked into old ways of thinking and doing, the industry does not wanna be locked into any one technology provider. So if you've just been mastering the art of running stateful distributed databases on a single cloud using Kubernetes, now you're being asked to do it all over again, now only in a hybrid or multi-cloud environment using Anthos, OpenShift, Tanzu, EKS Anywhere, or Azure Arc. Before I go on to the next section, uh, I just wanna take a moment for another quick audience poll. How much data do you have under management in your operational database systems? Less than a terabyte, one to 50 terabytes, 51 to 100 terabytes, or 100 terabytes or more? Please pick the answer that best matches your current data set. And we'll leave the poll up for a bit. And also do remember to use the Q&A feature to ask your questions and I'll answer them at the end. For now, let's go on. We've talked about this overall milieu that we're operating in, the zeitgeist. So now let's focus uh, down on how this specifically is impacting distributed databases. For everyone who has never visited this site, I wanted to draw your attention to dbengines.com. It's the billboard charts of databases. It keeps a rough popularity index of all the databases you can imagine, weighted using an algorithm that tracks things like the number of mentions on websites and the Google trends of searches, to discussions on Stack Overflow or mentions and tweets, to job postings asking for these as technical skills, to the number of profiles that mention these technologies by name in your LinkedIn profile. Some of these are distributed databases, some are not. Uh, you'll find a mix of systems, SQL, NoSQL, some databases that support both, some that support multiple kinds of NoSQL data models, and some systems that are not so easily categorized. This word cloud was generated using all of the entries on that list as of last month, uh, 381 systems. And the sizes of the words are based on their relative popularity as per the dbengines.com ranking. However, popularity should not be confused with fitness for use, especially fitness for your specific use case. Uh, many new systems are worth checking out. So I was only given an hour. Uh, I can't cover all 381. So we're gonna have to narrow down the field. You'll see me do that you know, from this. We're gonna go from 100 and then we'll narrow down to some more interesting use cases. Um, and by the way, hey, look, uh, SillyDB is included on the list. Can you see it? Uh, let me help. There you go. There it is, right between the T and the E of SQLite, okay? So we have a bit of work ahead of us, but I'm glad to say that on July 4th of this year, 2021, we at SillyDB celebrated by getting into the dbengines.com top 100 for the first time. Uh, we continue to rise, and as of yesterday, we were ranked 86 on the list. Nice, thank you. All right, so what constitutes the top 100 systems on dbengines.com? About half of those systems are SQL. About a third are NoSQL. Five of them are both SQL and NoSQL, uh, what's known as multi-model databases. And finally, a handful are search engines or time series databases or systems that are just hard to categorize in this way. So that's the top 100 databases or database-like systems. Are all these really distributed database systems? For some, we can clearly say yes. For others, we can clearly say no. And for many, it depends upon what you mean when you say distributed database. So just as there's no ANSI or ISO or IETF or W3C definition of what a NoSQL database is, there's no standard or protocol or consensus on what a distributed database is. 
So I took some time to write up my own definition based upon what I've experienced at just a couple of database developers in the industry. And I'm sure that your own experiences might lead you to define this ontology in a completely orthogonal manner. Plus, I'll freely admit that this is more of a layman's pragmatic view than a computer science professor's. First, I'd say that distribution is based upon having the database running in more than one system on a network. Now, if you've listened to our CTO, Avi Kaviti, he will argue that a single modern multi-core, multi-CPU node already constitutes its own network, but we won't explore that path today. When the industry began, you had one giant node, often a mainframe, running your database, or by the 1980s, it could be running in your desktop computer, but it was considered one thing. So for the sake of this argument, we'll define a node as a single computational whole, whether that node is a virtual instance or a physical server running your database. And we'll define a cluster as comprising one or more nodes. Thus, a distributed database needs to be running on a cluster of n nodes where n is greater than one. But now, if you have the database running across these multiple nodes, what do you do with their data? Do you split it as evenly as possible between them? That's known as sharding. Or do you keep full copies on of each of the nodes, that's called replication and a fully replicated data set at that. There's also literal issues of physical distance between your servers, because as far as I know, databases still need to obey the speed of light. So if you need to keep your databases in sync quickly, you need to make sure your cluster is localized in the same data center. That's a local cluster. It is a form of distributed database, but it's just the beginnings. If you wanna serve data close to users spread over a geographic area, you may be able to have multiple local clusters, one in the US, one in Europe, one in Asia, and that keeps local user latencies low. But now you may have to, uh, your disparate local clusters intercommunicate through some sort of synchronization or update mechanism in the background. For example, this is how DNS or Active Directory work. Each system operates on its own and there's a propagation delay between updates across the different systems. That might not be good enough for some production use cases. So if you are more tolerant to the speed of light propagation delays, you use what's known as eventual consistency, uh, and you may be able to spread the cluster itself around the world. Some servers may be in the US, others in Europe or Asia, yet it's still considered the same logical cluster. Next, you have the roles of the nodes in your database. Are they all peers? each cable of full rights, or are any of them designated as leaders or primaries with others designated as read-only replicas? Back in the day, it was common to have a replica set aside as a hot standby, only used in case the primary server went down. And that's still a successful model for many systems. But that hot standby is not taking any of the load. It's just sitting there idly humming just in case of emergency. In these so-called, um, <clears throat> let's see, that's why many people prefer peer-to-peer uh, -peer uh, leaderless topologies where everyone gets to share the load and there's no single point of failure and no need to spend time hiccuping during failover. Uh, and in these so-called active-active scenarios, how to keep the systems in sync is more complicated. It's literally a tougher thing to do, but if you can solve for it, you've eliminated any single point of failure in your database. Uh, also, even if you have a distributed database, that doesn't mean your clients are aware of the topology. So people can either implement load balancers to front end your distributed database, or they can implement client side load balancing by making intelligent clients that know how your database is sharded and route queries to the right nodes. Lastly, let's take a look at these replication and sharding strategies. Like I said, you can make each node a full replica of the entire database, say three full sets of data on three different servers, or you can distribute different pieces across multiple servers, partitioned somewhat differently on each server so that it's more difficult to lose any one piece of data even if two or more servers in a cluster dies. Let's say your cluster is 60 nodes in size. So consistency levels then determine how much uh, you need each of those replicas uh, to be in sync before you allow a read or write to complete. Let's say that your data is replicated three ways and you wanna make sure that all three are fully in sync at all times. You want a fully transactional strong consistency guarantee. Uh, that's totally different uh, than if you wanna make sure that only one node got an update and trust him, he'll tell two buddies about this update in the background. You can go back on with your day. That's called eventual consistency and it, uh, consistency, and it means that the database can play more fast and loose with the queries and under certain conditions, you may find your data becomes inconsistent. Next, for horizontal scalability, how does your system decide how to shard data across these nodes? At first, there was always a manual process. It was difficult and problematic to manage. 
So distributed databases implemented algorithms to automatically shard your data across nodes. And while that's far more, far more prevalent these days, there's still some distributed databases that haven't solved for how specifically to auto shard or make auto sharding an advanced feature that you don't get out of the box. Finally, and this is important for high availability, distributed databases need to understand their own physical deployments. Let's say you have a local cluster, but it's all in the same rack in the data center, and then somehow power is knocked out to it. Your whole system is down. So rack awareness means that the database can try and make sure that each server in a cluster is on its own rack, or that at least they're spread around as evenly across the available racks as possible. The same thing with data center awareness uh, across availability zones or regions. You want to make sure that no single data center disaster means that you've lost all or part of your database. That actually happened earlier this year to one of our customers, but because they were deployed across three different data centers, they lost zero data. So with this in mind, let's go into that top 100 and just find five examples to see how they compare. I've chosen two SQL systems and three NoSQL systems. You notice that I craftily snuck SillaDB into that shortlist. So before I proceed, I will fully apologize to anyone who's more familiar with these technologies than I am. I did my best to research these options, but I am not an expert user of, of them by any means. So if you spot any errors or any omissions in anything I may say, I respectfully ask you point them out in your comments. You can put them in the questions below and I'll take to correct my slides for any future iterations. Postgres is one of the most popular Im implementations of SQL these days. It offers uh, local clustering out of the box, and there are many different add-ons that you can get to provide cluster cross-cluster updates. However, Postgres, as far as I know, is still working on its multi-data center clustering. Because SQL is grounded in a strongly consistent transactional mindset, it doesn't lend itself well to spanning a cluster across a wide geography. Each query would be held up by speed of light latency delays, between all those relevant data centers. Uh, also, Postgres relies upon a primary replica model. One node in the cluster is the leader and the others are replicas. And while there are load balancers for it, uh, those are beyond the base offering. And finally, sharding in Postgres still remains a manual effort for the most part, though they are making advances in developing auto sharding, which are again, beyond the base offering. Cockroach builds itself as new SQL, a SQL database designed in mind for distribution. Note that it uses the Postgres wire protocol and borrows heavily from many of the concepts pioneered in Postgres. However, it doesn't limit itself to the Postgres architecture. Multi-data center clustering and peer-to-peer -peer leaderless topology is built in from the get-go. It's also auto sharding and it has got data replication. It has data center awareness built into it. And it's a SQL designed to be survivable and hence the name. MongoDB is the venerable leader of the NoSQL pack. So over time, it has developed a lot of distributed database capabilities. Um, now MongoDB is capable of multi-data center clustering. It still follows a primary replica, replica model for the most part, but there are ways to make it peer-to-peer active-active. -active. Next up is Redis. It's a key value store designed to act as an in-memory cache or data store. And while it can persist data, it suffers from a huge performance penalty if the data set doesn't fit in RAM. Because of that, it was designed with local clustering in mind. Because if you can't afford to wait five milliseconds to get data off an SSD, you probably can't afford to wait 135 milliseconds to make the network round trip time between San Francisco and London. Uh, however, there are enterprise features that do allow multi-data center Redis clusters for those who do need geographic distribution. Again, Redis operates primarily as a primary replica model, which is appropriate for a uh, read-heavy caching server. But what it means is that the primary is where the data needs to get written to first, which will then fan out to the replicas to help balance their caching loads. And again, there's an enterprise feature to allow peer-to-peer active-active clusters. Redis does auto shard and replicate data, but its topology awareness is limited to rack awareness in an enterprise feature, again, because it's designed just to be primarily operated in a single local cluster. Finally, we get to Scylla. It was patterned after the distributed database model found in Apache Cassandra. And so it comes by default with multi-data center clustering, a leaderless active-active topology, it automatically shards and has tunable consistency and even lightweight transactions to provide linearizability of rights. Rack awareness, data center awareness, all the goodness you need from a distributed database. 
Now that's only five of the top 100 databases. And we have to parse through them all to see how precisely, how closely, or how far away these databases are from the current definition of a distributed database. So while Captain America could do this all day, for now, let's move on. I was only given an hour for the talk. We looked at where distributed databases are already today. Now let's take a look at the specific trends that are shaping the way distributed databases are evolving. By the way, before we get into the trend of what we're moving towards, I want to say something about the trends and terms we're moving away from, specifically the acronym SQL. This Google trend shows the volume of searches on the term SQL itself are down 75% from 2004 when Google Trends began. Google Ngram Viewer also tracks book citations for SQL. And um, all the way back to the year the term was coined, you can see these decline 72% from the technology's peak appearance in print back in 2008, just before the dawn of the NoSQL revolution and back when people still read books. So the very term SQL, which is still predominant in industry mindshare, has dramatically eroded. By the way, it's not a term that's being replaced by anything in particular. If you were to graph NoSQL here or new SQL, they would essentially be a little more than flat lines along the x-axis. But it begs the question, what are we moving towards? What we're seeing is a continuing Cambrian explosion of databases and database-like systems. Uh, there's been a blurring or blending of what a database actually is and how it may fit into other technologies. For example, streaming systems like Confluent Kafka, which has touted KSQL for years. Um, uh, or think about hybrid systems uh, um, occurring with distributed ledgers, whether blockchains or directed acyclic graphs or so on, because I know for sure that a couple of these technologies use SiliDB in their architecture, like IOTA or Uniris. Um, big chain DB is built on MongoDB. There's people doing similar things with Postgres. There's a lot of blending going on and expect more of it. Uh, don't expect consolidation uh, on the market like we've seen with say, all the major cloud providers standardizing on Kubernetes as a de facto orchestration mechanism or Linux as a de facto operating system. This will be more like the programming language market which continues to evolve. New languages, new methods within each language look forward to continued fragmentation. Lastly, I want to say that while the term SQL itself is fading, the concepts that are so, so closely associated with it are making their way into NoSQL databases. Acid transactions, strong consistency, schema constraints, strict typing, and so on. Another issue that is being solved for, but can be solved for better, is the elasticity. If you need to provision more capacity for lunchtime crowds or the evening commute, or for a stochastic event you had no way to predict, um, you can't wait for six hours for the database to reshard and rebalance in the background. Lunchtime is over by then. The stochastic event you needed to hop on top of is in real time already passing you by. Uh, and I'm not going to lie, this is a hard problem to solve for. Scaling distributed stateful services and databases at terabyte to petabyte scales isn't going to simply happen with flipping of the light switch ease. Even hyperscalers like Amazon DynamoDB have rate limits to how quickly you can add capacity or remove it once the peak is passed. So uh, uncoupling compute from storage is also a growing trend for a couple of reasons. First is tiered storage, where you may want some data stored on fast, low latency media, whether that's persistent memory being used as storage or NVMe SSDs or block storage or even spinning hard drives. For example, uh, this uh, could be done for data that's not quite current, uh, but it hasn't reached its expiration date yet. The reason for this is TCO, so that you can save on not keeping all of your data in your most expensive media or performance in case you want to keep your most active data in a faster storage medium. Tier storage has architectural difficulties as well. You have the, uh, the issue of an impotence mismatch. The whole database can essentially seize up waiting for the slowest media if you haven't designed your queries or your data partitioning well. Just imagine the nightmare of a full table scan that hits your H, uh, HDDs, right? Plus a lot of systems current rely upon homogeneity in nodes and thus tiered storage can be an anti-pattern to their very design. Another uncoupling in distributed databases is plug-in storage. For example, Janus Graph is an open source Gremlin Tinkerpop graph data, uh, database. Um, 
It can use SciliaDB as a plug-in data storage layer, or it could use Cassandra or HBase or a variety of other NoSQL databases. Expect to see more of that where the storage engine itself can be swapped out while the user query language, the operational commands, and the configurations all remain the same from the app developer and DevOps perspective. This next trend I refer to as data over time. As I've said, we've moved from batch-oriented thinking to data streaming. So what database can afford uh, uh, to avoid thinking of time series data in the coming decade? What database can comfortably ignore the event streaming revolution? Uh, aren't we all going to have to consider how we handle data over time in that regard? Uh, point in time and bounded time frame queries, historical trend analysis, triggers and alarms. Uh, while sure, there are many data sets that are relatively static, this just screams at me as an emerging consideration for everyone designing and operating databases, solving real time problems. The next is what I call data over space. I talked about rack and data center awareness, but that doesn't consider actual physical topology. In the data itself, there are standards for geospatial queries and geo-querying, um, uh, sorry, geo-indexing, geo-json, and so on. They aren't universally implemented or implemented the same across systems. Um, simple latitude and longitude is pretty common today, but beyond that, Think of vehicular IoT in particular. You may also need to support data elements for altitude, attitude, roll, pitch, and yaw, speed, acceleration, and bearing, right? Uh, next, there are spatial requirements associated with jurisdictional and political boundaries. Can my data in server A be distributed to data um, to server database server B? Or more granularly, what tables or records or rows, columns, or specific cells of data can be shared or need to be masked? Uh, uh, or if I can share it across these jurisdic uh, jurisdiction boundaries from jurisdiction A to B, can B then pass it on to jurisdiction C? Is there any sort of provenance that needs to carry with that data as I share it? Uh, so there's a lot of policy-based rules that need to be um, considered when you're doing um, cross data center replication. And yes, some database vendors are already offering this kind of uh, capability, so expect more of it. And let's change perspective now. Rather than what a database is or does, let's reframe the question as, uh, as what a distributed database needs to enable a developer to do with it. Traditional databases have been a place where you wrote queries and you got results. And in this day and age, the database is a development platform where you're accessing APIs and upon which you're building full-blown apps. If databases are to be useful, they have to be accessible and flexible. And I can't think of an organization that did this better than, let's say, MongoDB. They focus squarely on the needs of the developer community to win the hearts and minds of a generation. And you can argue with me all, uh, all you want whether MongoDB is a good or, or a bad database, but 380,000 Twitter followers and nearly 21,000 GitHub stars means that they have objectively succeeded in attracting developers to their community by putting everything at the developer's fingertips and by centering their needs their desires and their whims first. Subsequently, you have plugins and APIs for MongoDB to do just about anything you can imagine from blockchain to Minecraft. And they're not alone in the industry. There are plenty of Postgres extensions and Redis modules. Uh, and so rather than having to fork an entire project just to add your desired feature, there are methods to hook in your logic to extend it beyond its basic capabilities. It's a game changer. This next trend um, that I'm gonna talk about is what I'm personally interested in watching evolve. With the NoSQL revolution, you had an explosion of query languages, grammars, uh, operations, input and output formats, encapsulations, transports, and so on. But now there are attempts, however tentative or halting, to adopt cross-system methodologies for making queries and returning results, and beyond just a REST API. This abstracts the database from how a developer perceives it, whether GraphQL or OpenAPI, or any of a myriad of other attempts to hide the database internals and create microservices and API gateways. Uh, and the next trend I see is this attempt to integrate AI and or ML directly into the da database, whether that means uh, predicate pushdowns from Apache Spark or building machine learning engines inside the database, such as Amazon Redshift machine learning or BigQuery ML and so on. As Martin Heller said, uh, be close to your data. It makes sense. Uh, it's happening already and expect that to proliferate across the industry. Uh, the one salient issue with this, I will point out, is that if you then have to ensure that there's some sort of computational guardrails 
on your distributed database so that someone running a mad science experiment won't bring your server to its knees. But the idea is theoretically sound and solvable. Speaking of this trend, Jesse Anderson wrote the book on the concept of data teams, where you are bringing together your data engineers, your data scientists, and your operations teams together. As I see it right now, uh, some organizations have part of their brain uh, in the hands of their CPU people, and another part of the brains in the hands of their GPU people. And I think that while we've made great strides, there's still more room to bring these folks together more cohesively. Uh, and this last point is one of my own invention. If the agile methodology was focused upon delivering software to users, shouldn't there be an analog for data teams? In other words, rather than think about just creating data pipelines, a very supply side thinking of how we produce data, should we also be thinking about data supply chains, considering all the disparate sources that our users need to draw from in order to obtain the results? It's more of a data consumer oriented vision. And let me know if you've had similar thoughts yourself. So what all of this kind of thinking leads to is that you have to make your distributed database systems easier all around, easier to obtain and consume, easier to sustain and manage, easier to use and observe. For the operations sides, this leads to two very different kinds of easy. The first is making everything fully managed, cloud hosted. You don't have to worry about backups or upgrades or monitoring or downtime, all that's off your plate. You just develop your app. Phew, that's easy. but it comes at a price measured in dollars. The second way of making it easy is the open source method. Just download it for free. You can run the same software on your laptop in a Dockerized containment environment that you can then deploy eventually to thousands of nodes in production. It's easy to obtain, not even a credit card's needed, but it also means you have a higher level required of education, of knowledge, your skill set, and all of that equates to a price to be paid in time spent. So of course, both kinds of easy are good for different constituencies. Scylla, for example, offers both Scylla Cloud and Scylla Open Source, yet many other distributed databases are only available as a service and others are only available as a self-managed open source. So, there's, so they're easy until they're not. Further, I believe that both kinds of easy as they exist today can be made even easier in the future by abstracting complexities behind great UI and UX and great developer experience. So, Thanks for joining me on this journey across the distributed database landscape. For those of you for whom this was familiar terrain, I hope you found some fresh perspective on the changes occurring all around you. For those of you for whom this was the first foray into the landscape, I hope you return. Uh, if you'd like to continue your exploration beyond today, I highly encourage you to join our SillyDB user community in Slack if you haven't already. We have thousands of like-minded folks who are there, um, they're far more knowledgeable and day-to-day -day practitioners and they're incredibly talented developers, far better than I could ever hope to be. Speaking about knowledgeable people, I also wanted to give a thanks and a shout out to a few individuals who provided me with some perspective of their own on the state of distributed databases, SillaDB's Kostya Ozapov and Oracle's Serge Leontiev. Um, uh, repeating my disclaimer, if there's anything I got wrong in my talk, that's on me. All I'd ask is to kindly send me corrections afterwards and I can keep learning and improving. With that, let's open up for questions and answers. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, so one of the questions I have here is um, the convergence of SQL and NoSQL. Um, we're seeing a lot of databases that, for instance, are listed on DB engines as being multi-model. Um, but for instance, they have, uh, they're primarily, let's say, they're primarily a SQL database with the capability of parsing and storing JSON. Does that really make them a NoSQL database? Um, I would argue no. I would say that that's probably still um, a SQL database, but with like a, you know, just a, a toe in the water of NoSQL. Um, there are some systems out there that are both SQL and NoSQL. They are actually doing um, uh, multi-model very well. Uh, the question I would have is how well do they do each of those tasks? They, they, they become more general purpose, um, but uh, are they performant? Let's see. The, uh, the next question we have here has to do with search engines. Search engines are, are, are a tough thing to define as SQL or NoSQL. They're not either, uh, they're not really either. They're more true unstructured data. 
Um, so I think that what you're starting to see, though, is search engines are becoming an inherent component of either a SQL or NoSQL systems. Um, and it's, it's going to be, uh, uh, I think, a trend in the future to see how we uh, make our data queryable. Uh, so what are all the different ways we can apply, um, let's say, uh, conditional logic statements, um, regular expressions, things like that. Uh, how can that go into more structured kind of data? Um, you know, nobody's going to grab a SQL database these days. It would, it would be terrible for performance. But I think that we're still going to uh, struggle with that. Is like, how do we find the actual data we're looking for? And SQL is great in terms of a lot of types of queries, but um, but again, there are people who keep on looking to find like you know literal ter uh, text strings uh, and more complex terms. So search engines definitely fill in a gap. Let's see. And the one last question I see here is, how do I find out more about uh, SillaDB? Uh, well, I, I would invite you to check out uh, Scylla University. I'll provide a link for that in just a second, but it's a free online university where we have tons of courses. Uh, we have some courses for everybody uh, from beginners to experts. Uh, and in fact, we even have um, uh, every couple of times a year, we have a Scylla University Live, which you're definitely uh, welcome to attend. Here's another question here. Is there a potential risk from abstracting database internals from developers? There is, there is, by the way. Uh, let me let me step back and go to programming languages and show you the risk here from a, a programming um, a perspective. When you've abstracted the hardware from, uh, let's say, a Java developer, Java developers not allowed to know the actual hardware they're operating on, and because of that, they can't get maximum use out of their their underlying infrastructure. They just can't. And this is one of the reasons why Scylla was written in C++ is because we can actually take a look at the hardware resources on a far more concrete basis and get the maximum utility out of them. So yes, that same kind of analogy applies for abstracting database internals from developers. There may be certain features that an abstracted query language is going to hide from you. You know, um, I'm just thinking of a case recently where uh, a database as a service provider uh, didn't allow their users to get access to uh, experimental features, right? Those features, the user knows those features are in the system, but because it's hidden behind a database as a service user interface, they can't enable them, you know? And, and that's an interesting thing, you know, like, uh, you know, I know that these are dangerous features and I could be shooting myself in the foot, but, you know, the, the, the service provider won't be, allow me to shoot myself in the foot because they would have to clean up my mess. <laughs> So I think the same is going to be true with a lot of these kind of abstraction layers. Like, will they? How complete will the abstraction layer implement the uh, the native query system or the native uh, uh, language that you're it's it's hiding you from? So yes, uh, you are completely correct. There is a potential risk from abstracting uh, things, and that's always uh, true when you when you provide an abstraction layer. All right, I wanted to thank. Oh, we oh we just got another question. What do you think about cross database sync replica? Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, say we have a general purpose database and we need to enable a full text search. Uh, so you have to use Elasticsearch, for example, and uh, you have to replicate your data to Elastic as well and so on. Ah, currently you do that on an app level. Maybe there's an idea for a cross database sync. That is a perfect thing. And yes, this does exist. Uh, change data capture. Uh, it was, uh, it's, Take it a while for us to, to get all the implementation pieces because it's not just having change data capture in Scylla DB, but then it's you need that last step. How do you then get it to Elasticsearch? So now we do have a solution for that. You would enable change data capture on a specific table, and that CDC table shadowing your base table would then keep track of all the diffs. It could be the pre image, it could be the post image, it could be just the diffs or all of those. And then you can push out those diffs using change to the capture through a CDC uh, source connector to Kafka, to a Kafka topic. And then Elastic would just subscribe to that CDC, to, uh, to that Kafka topic, and then it would be getting, getting the update. And that would allow both systems to remain relatively in sync. Now there is still a propagation delay. You know, there's going to be a time of ingestion to Kafka and a time of ingestion into Elastic. But now you're dealing with like a few minutes delay in your sync and it's being done at an atomic uh, record level. It's not a batch uh, sync level. Here we go. Picking a DB for a particular use case is already a tricky challenge. 
Uh, with the landscape becoming more cluttered with specialized features, time series, streaming, et cetera, do you see this challenge getting more difficult over time as there's no win fits uh, all size solution? Yes, it will become easier and simpler. And let me, uh, let me, and it will become more difficult. So let me, let me give you an example. Uh, you have this kind of troika that I see evolving um, with, uh, let's say, a production database, Kafka, and Apache Spark. Like I'm seeing that over and over and over again, that those three things are kind of like everybody's got them, right? Everybody needs a production database. Kafka is not going to be that production beta database. Spark's not going to be that database. You need an analytics problem. Kafka is not going to be that your production database. You don't want to be that because that would hammer your, your capacity of being able to take real live transactions. So Spark serves that role. And then you need some sort of glue, some sort of data pump between these systems. And that becomes Apache Kafka. So that's kind of like, there's so these, these uh, reference frames that are going to occur. But then what you want is you want to have this extensible model that allows you to plug in your specialized engines. Because maybe, for instance, you need not just your transactional database and not just your basic analytics in Spark, but you really do need to make this a graph data model. And so you're going to take your Kafka topics and update um, a node uh, for J, a, a Neo for J, or you're going to update a Janus graph, and then you're going to do your graph databases there. So um, yeah, so what you're going to see is you're going to start seeing media or strata, which will standardize whether that's a Kafka type system, which of course now Red Panda also supports the Kafka protocol, or you'll see like pulsars. You'll see these kind of streaming protocols that everybody will standardize upon. You'll see some data interchange type systems. Um, and then of course, if you take a look at, at the query languages, you can see that uh, CQL, uh, the Cassandra query language is used across Scylla. It's used on Cassandra, of course, it's used on Datastax Enterprise, Cosmos DB, Yugabyte. Like, so the query languages are gonna be standardized. And I think what you're gonna start seeing is more kind of like these uh, layer cakes you know, of different things handling different aspects of, a, of an overall solution. So if you fit into those easy models, those reference implementations will become more standardized in the coming years. But if those just don't work for you, if you really need some specialized uh, compute or you need some sort of specialized analytics, then yeah, you're probably gonna spend some time doing some searching beyond that. But the good news is, is that you have 380 things to search through on DB engines alone. <laughs> So, um, you know, I think that, the, that that is the issue is managing complexity is going to be an increasing uh, risk for a lot of these things because nobody wants to be fired. You know, the old days, you, you know, nobody wants to be fired if they don't uh, buy IBM. Nobody wanted to be fired if they didn't buy Cisco, right? We don't have that same thing in the data space right now, the data engineering space. There's no one thing that you can be sure upon that if you built your systems using that, like, you know, that that's job security right there. Um, we're seeing, by the way, there's a lot of things that were great in 2015 when I first entered the NoSQL uh, 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 community. Um, there was a lot of things that were around back then. Who's building, who would start a greenfield with Hadoop these days? And it's only five years later, right? So you're going to have to be get very careful about watching for these trends and making sure that if one of these particular functions, if one of these Lego bricks is just not working anymore, that you can swap it out really quickly. Uh, so I would, the one thing I would recommend is take a look to see what your options are. Like, does this, is this a true vendor lock-in or is it a kind of a thing that can be substituted or evolved over time? That's a great question, by the way. All right. And I think that's all the questions we have right now. This has been a wild ride for the last hour. Um, let me uh, just close up here then with a, just a few more slides. Um, oops, went the wrong way. Here we go. So if anything else comes up um, uh, and you want to follow up with me, I am at Twitter, uh, at Peter Corliss on Twitter. And if you want to learn more, like I said, uh, you can check out all the free uh, Silly University courses. Um, and other than that, have yourself a great day. And as ever, onwards to adventure.